Thank you very much, Terry, and I appreciate everybody's indulgence in the crowd for sticking it out on a panel for so long. Um, I think uh, being the last speaker, I have the benefit of uh, kind of emphasizing some of the points that have already been made, but also maybe filling in a few gaps uh, of things that have not yet been said. So Dave mentioned that we've got at least 180 different aquatic invasive species already in the Great Lakes Basin. So what's the big deal about Asian carp? Well, quite simply, they are a game changer. They're an ecosystem changer. They take out the bottom of the food web, and that's one of the reasons why we're so focused on Asian carp. John did mention, uh, or I think maybe it was Dave, that they are the poster child. Uh, no other invasive species that we have in the Great Lakes presents itself to the public so well as Asian carp does. The, the pictures of jumping fish, the videos that everybody have seen, the fact that they uh, give you such a visible representation and show you exactly what the population of is as in some of those videos. It's something that people have not seen before with other species such as uh, zebra mussels or the spiny water flea or those other aquatic invasive species that are having just as big an impact on our ecosystems probably as Asian carp might. So, um, and, and John has talked about the one major pathway that Asian carp are likely to come into Ontario. But for a long time, Ontario has been worried about the other vector, which is the overland transport of, of live Asian carp coming into the food fish markets of Ontario. So I'm going to touch on that because that's an important point, and we've been just as, fo as much focused or more on that in Ontario as we have been. Uh, I don't think we've had the luxury of tracking an, an invasive species coming into our waters so much as we have with Asian carp. Often, um, I'm going to change this, uh, we don't even know what these species are. They arrive, they start to establish themselves, we don't know where they came from, we don't know what the impact is going to be. So. Uh, one of the things that Ontario is really focused in on, and we had a, a, an invasive species strategic uh, plan that we uh, proposed last year or that we approved last year with our colleague ministries of the Envi Environment, Agriculture and Transportation. But that really emphasized that we, and Dave made this point as well, that we are better to prevent the um, arrival of invasive species because it's by far the most cost-effective strategy. But if we can't prevent them, then first of all, we have to be able to identify them. We have to be able to, de to, to detect them when they first arrive when they're in small quantities, because that's when you have the best uh, options for control and eradication. Uh, rapid response and, and governments don't usually go together in the same sentence, but um, I, I, I'm sincere in this in that we have to understand how rapidly to respond uh, to all of these invasive species and, and be prepared for them. So with that in mind, I'm, I'm kind of starting at today and I'll work backwards a bit in our invasive species history. Uh, just last, or at the end of February, uh, and the deputy mentioned it this morning, uh, this government introduced an Invasive Species Act. It, um, at, at its core, there's probably 20 different pieces of federal and provincial legislation that have little bits and pieces of tools that we would need to uh, uh, meet these, uh, this, these objectives of uh, prevention, detection, rapid response. But it wasn't consolidated. It wasn't really designed to do what the job is that we needed to do. So this act will bring together all those tools that we need to uh, respond to invasive species and put some of the onus back on some of the people who are bringing some of these species in on trade, as the deputy mentioned this morning as well. It really will be one of the key pieces of our approach to dealing with Asian carp in Ontario. But it will also be effective in dealing with uh, uh, fish and wildlife diseases, uh, terrestrial bugs that uh, are potentially going to infect our forests, and some plants that have an uh, impact on our ecosystem as well. So it's up on the environmental registry right now. I encourage people to look at it, and I know that uh, the Federation, we gave them a, an early briefing on this one. It really does bring together some of the things that we've been saying is missing for quite some time now. What does the um, Invasive Species Act do for Asian carp, though? One of the key pieces in there is the opportunity to develop a prevention and response plan. So there's, of all the invasive species that we're likely to see, there's a few of them that are really significant threats. So Asian carp is one of those. In the forestry world, it's probably going to be a pest like the uh, mountain pine beetle, um, those types of things. And we're seeing uh, similar uh, impacts on the ecosystem from uh, Phragmites, which are impacting our coastal wetlands especially. But what the prevention and response plan will do will be allow us to look at the threat that this thing poses in a very comprehensive way. 
We'll be able to look at all the, the vectors, uh, similar to the uh, Glimmers report, uh, the ways that this thing might arrive, all the different carriers that might be used to bring the thing to Ontario's borders, and then who, more importantly, has the tools and responsibilities to respond to that threat. So uh, in 2011, we did develop an early precursor of such a plan for Asian carp. Uh, it, it was a, an emergency response plan. Um, together with Fisheries and Oceans, we uh, did a tabletop exercise where we tested our preparedness. We did a, um, a scenario uh, dealing with some of the overland transport of fish, and uh, it, it identified some holes in our system, and I think with the new act, we'll be able to, uh, uh, to respond to those holes and fill those gaps. The act will allow us to do uh, a lot better job at restricting the movements, the possession and sale, not only of Asian carp, but of other species as well. Dave mentioned that uh, Ontario uh, put out an evisceration discussion paper in, in 2013. This is really public consultation in advance of Ontario presenting to the federal government for the Invasive Species Regs under the Fisheries Act to kind of say, yes, people in Ontario say that this is the way that we have to deal with this. And finally, um, and we're really pleased that the, uh, the federal government will be passing these regulations because what it does is then provides a consistent framework for Ontario and our border uh, provinces of Manitoba, Quebec, we will know that everybody's got the same rules. We don't have to worry about uh, watching our back on whether species are coming at us from other ways. A little bit of uh, a word on enforcement, and some of our enforcement branch staff are here today. They've got a display out in the, um, in the, uh, in the hallway, so I encourage you to speak to any of the enforcement folks that are here. But we have, um, since 2005, always had a regulation that prevented the possession, transport, and movement of live Asian carp and a number of other species, including snakehead, gobies. And if, if you want to see what a snakehead looks like, that's the fish that's out in the hallway by the enforcement display. We've recognized that these are represented back then some of the major threats to Ontario's waters. How were they coming to Ontario at the time when, you know, even in 20, 2005, I don't know how far up the Mississippi they were. Well, these fish were uh, coming at us from uh, aquaculture operations, mostly in the southern U.S., Louisiana, Georgia, and they were coming up into Toronto mostly for the live food fish market. So here's a picture of a live food fish hauler truck. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, we, we, we import live fish on many different species, but at the time, Asian carp was seen as being a particularly uh, threatening species, so. Um, but as Dave mentioned, sometimes the, uh, the preference for live fish uh, far outweighs the, um, the ethics of not transporting uh, live fish. And uh, we've been intercepting a number of these live haulers that have come across the border uh, with, with uh, Asian carp of all species. Uh, $235,000 in fines to date. Uh, we also inspect the uh, markets themselves. Some of our conservation officers go through there and anybody who's marketing in these fish are also subject to the same kind of fines and there's been a, an additional hundred and plus thousand dollar fines levied to the retailer side as well as to these live haulers. Clearly, uh, this is not enough of a deterrent, so if I can get you a focus back on the Invasive Species Act, we've added in that act, the provision for fines, fees, and penalties, which are severe enough to take away the incentive to try to bring in live fish or any other type of invasive species. On the uh, surveillance side, there's been a lot spoken about eDNA surveillance, and what that is for folks that aren't familiar, every species, uh, us included, leave traces of our DNA behind wherever we go. Uh, I'm at the podium here. I'm sure if I did a test of the podium, I'd find traces of John and Dave on here. Uh, not a lot, but there's traces of them, and, and that's what eDNA does. It allows, it's a sampling technique that allows us to take water samples, and you can see on the bottom picture here, uh, just a jar, uh, from various locations, put them through, uh, f uh, dry, dry out the samples, put them on filters, and then do eDNA analysis. It was a technique that was really developed for a lot of other purposes. It helps us to detect any species that's in small numbers that it's hard to count. So we were using it on the endangered species side, trying to figure out if uh, you know the species is present, even though we may or may not be able to see them. But it's really had a lot of benefit to our surveillance for Asian carp, because even though we don't think Asian carp are already on the Ontario side of the waters, this type of technique allows us to verify that. 
Um, a couple of years ago, there was uh, reports of silver carp uh, being found on the uh, uh, U.S. side of Lake Erie down in the Maumee River Basin. Um, that kind of kicked us into high gear. We went, uh-oh, uh, are they here already? Back to my point, if you, if you can't prevent them, you better be able to, de to detect them when they're still in small numbers. So in 2012, 2013, Ontario uh, and, and DFO worked uh, together to sample a lot of uh, Ontario's waters. We used the risk assessment that was developed by nationally to kind of look at the most likely places for fish to uh, be um, already is occurring. Um, you can see in the map uh, a lot of um, uh, sampling in the Thames River Basin, the St. Clair Basin, and the Western Basin of Lake Erie. Uh, but we also looked at uh, the Grand River and other uh, places like that. And I have to acknowledge that Bruce Hawkins is in the crowd here today. Bruce, maybe if you could just wave. Bruce is our uh, Lake Erie manager uh, based out of um, London with uh, stations in Wheatley and Port Dover. Um, and it's his staff that have been out on the water helping to do this sampling. Uh, Good news is, with all the sampling that we've done on the U.S. side, we compared it and we shared this information with our folks on the U.S. side. Uh, 1,400 samples in, in, uh, since we started and no Asian carp eDNA had, uh, detected so far. Doesn't mean they're not there, but at least we're looking and, we're, and we're, we're, you can see we've got pretty broad coverage on our sampling program. Uh, looking ahead to 2014, what are we going to be doing? And there's a lot of lessons learned from what's happened in 2012 and 2013. Uh, we, we did find uh, some live grass carp. Um, how'd they get there? How long have they been there? Lots of questions. Did our DNA sampling pick up the fact that there was live grass carp in the Thames, in the, sorry, in the Grand River? Uh, the answer to that is partially yes, but no. Um, so we do rely on other forms of observation surveillance to make sure uh, that uh, Asian carp in, uh, aren't in Ontario waters. The first grass carp that we did uh, get last year was reported to us from a recreational angler. Um, caught this fish, didn't know what it was, uh, kind of posted it on the, on the recreational fishing blog. I think it was a staff member at DFO was cruising the website and said, uh oh, that looks like a grass carp. Immediately went down and, and took possession of the fish. Good news was by the time, uh, this was on a Saturday, by the time our, fo our staff at the OFH hotline looked at the records over the weekend. This was, in fact, reported to us through the hotline, proving that folks like you in this room really have a role to play. Um, it was just a real quick time. I, I was quite proud of DFO, by the way, of uh, being able to do that in such real time. Can I get a tape? Around? Yes, uh, <laughs> you can. And I'll, so Dave promised me a beer for that one. Um, so anyhow, uh, back to what we plan on doing. Do we need to do as much eDNA surveillance as, as we are doing, or are there other things that we can be doing uh, to make sure? Uh, we're concerned about grass carp. We need to be concerned about black carp as well. So we're having a meeting next week with DFO, and we're going to do our lessons learned, adjust our plans accordingly. Uh, Dave's got a brand new lab in Burlington, as he mentioned. A lot more capacity to do some of this sampling uh, turning over a lot quicker. Uh, M&R can focus maybe on some other areas that uh, DFO doesn't have the capacity or, um, um, or the uh, staff to do. So I think we, bottom line is that we're working very well together on the Canadian side. Uh, but we are both members of the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee. It's very important, as John mentioned, that we're standing shoulder to shoulder on this one. This is a uh, this problem doesn't recognize national or state provincial bound boundaries. We have to work on this together because once they arrive, you've seen what the potential impacts are. Furthering on the science side of things, as I mentioned, eDNA is a relatively new branch of science. Uh, so our folks at Trent University, uh, the, the um, MNR researchers that we have there, are looking to expand uh, the list of species that we can look for using this technique. So we're going to be designing the, the comparator samples for snakehead, Eur Eurasian rough, round goby. Um, we've kind of shared our experience uh, with the DFO staff on our DNA lab with their DFO lab. So we're going to make sure that our, we have shared protocols. We can uh, really work well together. And finally, uh, we are refining 
our risk assessment guidelines. And risk assessments are really important concept in that not every invasive species is going to pose the same threat to our environment, our economy, and our ecosystems. So we have to make sure that we're focusing our efforts on those that pose the biggest threat. Clearly, silver and big head carp are right up there, but who knows what else is out there. And I'll, I'll, uh, sometimes our enforcement officers go down to the live food fish market in, as, in, in Toronto and, and look at this thing that's kind of in a bin for sale and they have no clue what it is and they have to purchase a specimen and take it off to the Royal Ontario Museum for positive identification. Well, that's, that's kind of the wrong way to approach the file. We should say that nothing's allowed into Ontario that hasn't had a risk assessment done on it. If through that risk assessment we determine it's a medium or low risk thing, well then, okay, let's talk about it. But if it's high risk, the answer is no, it's not going to be allowed in Ontario. Finally, on the outreach side, education is very key. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the partnership that we've established recently with a number of other partners uh, called the Invasive Species Centre. Dillery Fernando, Dillery, if you could just wave your, your hand. Dillery is the executive director of the Invasive Species Centre based out of Sault Ste. Marie. Um, uh, m and is providing the center uh, over a million dollars and has been for the number of uh, past number of years. It really brings together folks in a collaborative way on things like research, education and outreach, but it also helps us to talk about our regulatory regimes and our policy gaps together because we've got DFO there, we've got the Canadian Food Inspection Agency there, Natural Resources Canada, uh, and Ministry of Natural Resources, and then a lot of the academic uh, folks that uh, are involved in invasive species research. Uh, the Invading Species Awareness Program, what can I say about that? Angelo gave an overview today. Uh, staff over in the side here uh, spend a lot of their time. The, uh, the hit squads that are very visible uh, outreach mechanisms every summer uh, really help to bring that message through. OFH has been an outstanding partner since we started that one. The hotline, as I mentioned, has been a fantastic tool. Um, as a, for instance, even with that one grass carp I mentioned, we had 38 different calls to the hotline last year of people saying, I think I've seen an Asian carp. Um, that's, that's a really good way of doing it. Th uh, thankfully for us, uh, only one of those turned out to be a real Asian carp instance. But if we didn't get those people saying, I think I've seen something, can you come out and have a look or can you verify, uh, we wouldn't have that ability to jump on an issue when it was still contained. Um, uh, it's critical to get out, out there. But uh, I think the, the thing that we've learned, and uh, we're, we're taking a lesson from some of our, uh, part, or some of our colleagues in the southern United States as well, as well, there's this new tool called EDMAPS. It stands for Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. Uh, what this is going to do, it's a web-based application. People can go on to this site, take a picture of this thing that you are wondering about with your smartphone. How many people in this room don't have smartphones? Oh, okay, well, you're maybe not our target audience, but anyhow, <laughs> I was expecting two, for, okay. Anyhow, so OFH is gonna, the next partnership OFH is gonna develop, I'm sure, is a smartphone partnership for members, and you'll get a discounted rate with, uh, I don't know, don't, don't buy a black bear, maybe. Anyhow, EdMaps is, is going to be a tool that allows us in real time to help people identify what that thing is that they saw. They can submit a photograph. We've got the, the, the geographic reference of where it was. If it is an invading species, well then we can immediately send them back a link as to what it is, what you can do about it, or now we know if it's one of those serious threat species, where it is, who saw it, when, you know, when it was last seen, and, and then we can also start mapping the distribution and, and, um, and the uh, occurrences of some of these species. So all of these things together, and all of us in this room working together, um, is what it's going to take to keep invasive species out of the province, and if they do get here, to kind of keep them at numbers that don't start having ecosystem impacts. So with that, Terry, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you.